uh, make sure to come to this uh, to the stage area. If you can see us here in the back, you know, if you explore a little bit, you'll find us in the kind of the half floor. It's not the first floor. The second floor is kind of in the half floor where the presentation is going to take place. And for those that don't know, the Sunken Blimp stage, this is a space that we created, uh, right? Sure My name is Mateus. I'm one of the co-founders of Sunken Blimp. Uh, and we created this we'll environment to bring back, in interesting you know, to people to talk about bit. the interesting stuff that they do. As vague as that sound, you know, we wanted to keep it vague because we've had people on the stage from all sorts of fields before. We've had people that are, you know, architects, designers. We've had scientists, neurologists talking about how you know, virtual environments can help medicine. We've had people using 2000s style graphic design to display comedy. Like <laughs> the amount of people we've had here is is kind of wild. Um, so we are very excited about this conversation we're going to have today with Dr. Lydia uh, Kostopoulos. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you guys will enjoy it as well. So is anyone here uh, first time coming to the second boom stage? Not putting anyone, you know, in the line, but you can always use the chat as well to communicate. And if you're new to spatial, you know, like just going through a couple of keys, because I'm sure like some people don't really know, you can always react to things. If you're using a computer, like, yes, you say yes. Letter N, you say no. Um, if you hold C, you clap so you you can always react to a conversation there you go um and we got a really nice presentation prepared uh if you hadn't had a chance yet i would recommend you guys can always explore and look around the stage dr lydia prepared you know the stage with various different areas with really interesting information and she's going to be talking through the presentation and and i'm hoping <laughs> this is just a part inside me uh, Dr. Lydia, I hope at some point part of this rapid technolo technological change includes what's going on with UFOs and the Disclosure Project. And if not, we can always have a conversation afterwards. <laughs> I'm so that. sorry it doesn't. <laughs> but it <laughs> does include other things that I think you'll find interesting. For sure. I bet. I bet. But after after this conversation, I would love to pick your brain on some of the stuff that has been coming out this week and the past week. I'm not sure if you you, you saw a lot of it, but there was a press conference in Washington uh, two days ago on the 12th that showcases a pretty cool type of technology that hasn't really been public yet. Um, but yeah, we'll have time for that. So, all right, as more people are joining, I would like to get started with the introductions. So. Hey everyone, I just introduced myself to you guys, but I would like to introduce our very special guest here today. And for those that, those that don't know, Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos is a renowned global tech consultant specializing in strategy, security, and emerging technologies, serving distinguished entities such as the U.S. Special Operations, NATO, the United Nations, the IEEE Standard Body. Her insights are held in high regards. Dr. Dr. Kostopoulos crea uh, creatively advocates for tech awareness through the unique art. She is also in the developer. Uh, she's also the developer of the interactive game Sapien 2.0, exploring the nexus of humanity and machines. Additionally, she owns a boutique fashion label, empowering workwear, uh, crafting statement pieces to promote women's equality and discuss national security issues. So thank you very much, Dr. Lydia, for being here. And the stage Thank you for is having all me. Yours. Hi. Um, thank you so, so much for this invitation. Um, as soon as I got it, I looked up uh, Sunken Blimp and I was like, oh my gosh, yes. How can I hang out and be with people who are interested in exploring ideas, stories, experiences through any medium, not having any restrictions? And so um, we got on a call and there's a topic I've been thinking about. Traditionally, I talk about emerging technologies and kind of the use cases for businesses, for the military, and um, also looking at the new value propositions and all of that. But as I look at all these things, I also think about how it changes our society, but I don't do uh, public engagements really on, on these topics. I make art about it and I hope you'll get a chance to walk around 
the a stage that I've set up. I've put different exhibits for you to see. And um, yeah, so this this presentation really is about things that, I've, that have been on my mind as I am looking at how things are changing. And I hope you will find this presentation to be of interest. So um, first, uh, just to give you an idea of what we're going to talk about, I'm going to tell you what's happening. Then we're going to talk about digital and algorithmic relationships. Then we're going to talk about kind of the things that are changing real fast and then get to um, the identity and humanity part. So what's happening? Um, what's happening is, is that we have an abundance is an understatement. But we have a plethora of social media, of mediums to communicate and express ourselves. And that is pretty cool. So, for example, we're all here dressed up in uh, the way that we want to be dressed up and express ourselves and how we want to express ourselves. And that's really great and cool. However, it also comes with challenges because we have a galaxy and a universe of all of these different spaces from Facebook to Instagram to LinkedIn to MySpace to Slack, to TikTok, to Telegram, to Signal, to Discord, to Reddit, to WeChat, to Clubhouse. I mean, it's, it's immense, this space. And then within this space, we have our, our personas, our digital selves that we curate and we cultivate. And, we, and if we don't, I remember going to somebody's profile on Instagram um, the other week and it was totally empty. And it reminded me of like somebody who just didn't take care of their front lawn and just weeds everywhere and the grass went, went yellow. That's kind of the equivalent. And so, but we still have to maintain our digital personas for work um, and also to maintain uh, friendships as well. So to do that, um, we, we have DMs in all over the spaces. We've got notifications, we interact with things. And before you know it, we don't even know where we saw what or who messaged us where. And we find ourselves, um, and I, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how, if you could do a show of hands or something, how many people have missed messages and how many people have seen other, uh, people have told them, hey, I messaged you. And you're like, where? Because I've lost the bowl on it. And so to a certain degree, our, our life is becoming quite big and that is going to be just a small seed because I'm going to be bringing up some things that Taylor Swift said. And part of the things I read that she had said were part of the um, igniting kind of flame for this presentation because I thought it's really everybody. And so what's happening is, is we are doing this 24 um, seven. Some people wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and they put on, turn on their phone and there they are again interacting likes dms posts retweets you name it so that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing um however i do think that it is something that we need to think about in terms of our identity and so enter in this taylor swift quote about her uh song anti-hero she said Antihero is one of my favorite songs I've ever written. I don't think I've delved as far into my insecurities in this detail. I struggle a lot with the idea that my life has become unmanageably sized. Not to sound too dark, but I just struggle with the idea of not feeling like a person. And I thought to myself and the many people I know whose life has become unmanageably sized and they have nowhere near a fraction of her fame. And, and the, the people that I can think of they've got teams of other people who are managing their followers and their network and, and their dms and they're leveraging ai to record their conversations and then give them summaries and i i kind of thought i wonder if we all have a lot in common with this particular sentence that my life has become unmanageably sized and then i thought about the next part about um, the the challenge to our personhood. And I mean, again, the, she has a completely different problem set in terms of the amount of fame she has. But if we think about ourselves, when we are constantly interacting with others through digital mediums, um, there's an element of our personhood that changes. And this is the premise of this presentation that I want us to be thinking about the many versions of our digital selves. Um, do, they, do they all match? 
are they very different? And if so, um, does that create an internal struggle within you about understanding who you are? If you are, for example, a fabulous dragon in one place, in another place, you are struggling to conform to what you think is appropriate for your specific community. Um, or if you're worried about losing a job and so you, you censor yourself. So that's th this first part is really about kind of what, what's ha happening. Now, let's just put that aside on the table and talk about another aspect. Another aspect is, is that we're in these digital spaces that we are interacting with. We are also interacting with things that are not real. So we've got one example that's physical and digital. So there are uh, human humanoid um, sex dolls and they also come with an app. I just bring this up because you can have the app without the doll, but it's really interesting when you can combine the two together. Um, this film, this, this um, screenshot is from a film called High AI and I really, really recommend it. It was in the Berlin Film Festival in 2019. And um, the director of this film went to Japan, to the US and other places to film people interacting with robots of all kinds. And she didn't put any opinion into it. She just presented these videos. And this uh, screenshot that we have right here is of an American man um, who has purchased a doll and he's interacting with the app with her and uh, the AI isn't perfect so he has to kind of phrase things quite simply and all of that but and I don't want to spoil it but I, I left the film feeling like this is actually really useful and it can provide a form of companionship and that we need to to start to explore these types of relationships. And that was part of the inspiration of this piece called I Can Complete You, which is um, upstairs in the art exhibit area. This is um, over hundreds of um, glass mirrored rhinestones. And it says, I can complete you in heart rhinestones. And it has a halo on top of the robot and uh, a heart inside the, the chest cavity. And the premise is, is that can an artificial intelligence algorithm that serve as a companion, can it, can it be something we can enjoy spending time with, whether it has a physical component to it or, or not? Today, we have a lot of synthetic relationships. And um, you have ones like here on the right hand side where you can have an anime so you know it's a cartoon, it's not real, but it can be your girlfriend. And in fact, there, this um, particular article gives you the top 10 best AI girlfriend apps that you can customize. On the left hand side um, is something quite recent. There's a influencer who created a digital AI girlfriend of herself. She um, has a voice component and a text component. So you subscribe and you are able to interact with her digitally curated self. And that algorithm will respond obviously any time of the day because it's not her and it's a machine. And you pay extra if you want the response to be as a voice note. And the voice note is very authentic to her voice. And she's already making a lot of money um, uh, doing that. And so I want to just pause for a second to say, now we've, we've talked about the many identities we have online, but then now we are interacting with a lot of different kinds of algorithms that are agents inside our digital space. Um, so I have downstairs, uh, I put some information about my game Sapien 2.0. You can access it online and it's best accessed through a mobile phone. It's a website, but the website's designed for use on a phone. And there are a lot of questions about technologies that ch challenge, um, our human experience from birth to death. 
And th there's a lot of these kinds of, of questions there. And the whole point is for us to start talking about these things so that we can be intentional and purposeful and have agency in our own lives uh, when we incorporate these technologies into them. So let's get now to the rapid technological change part. So we talked about how we have tons of profiles and how now we are in this digital space also interacting with algorithms and increasingly more so. Sometimes we know we're doing it, sometimes we don't know we're doing it. Um, but now we've got technologies that can upload our mind. And in essence, there would be a copy of ourselves. Now, from a technical perspective, um, this doesn't necessarily exist just yet. There's a company that will uh, store your brain until they can figure out, I mean, you have to die first, but they'll, then they'll store your brain and then digitally upload it. But in the meantime, there you can do what that influencer did, um, where, and also um, Deepak Chopra did that. He's a mindfulness guru, and he created a, a digital version of himself that people can interact with and engage in mindfulness meditation and all that. So the way that works is, is that you would upload a whole bunch of information about yourself, things that you said, talks you've done, books you've written, articles you've written, and um, you'd curate the algorithm to be like you. That's one digital version. And then the other one where, where many technologists are, are working towards is this kind of upload. Whether or not your consciousness would be with it or not is a completely different conversation. However, this really creates questions about who are we? Are we flesh and blood? Are we digital synthetic algorithmic personas? And even the personas that we have right now that we manage, or if you have a team that manages your, your public profile, I mean, are we that profile? Are we that persona? So um, this, this is that uh, Nectome is one of the companies that will do that for, for you. And this will be particularly interesting to see as we engage in digital environments more with non with with people who are not behind them humans are that are not there they're just algorithms so um i want to share two aspects from this uh video it is um by the center for humane technology and um the these two are also the the creators of the film social dilemma if anybody's familiar with that so this um presentation is called the ai dilemma you can find it on youtube and basically, they want to highlight that we need to be very aware about how algorithms are affecting us individually and how they are affecting us as a, a community. And the way that they compare it, which I think is a very effective way to communicate it, is they talk about it as if it's our first contact with aliens. So they explain the first contact and they said the first contact with algorithms was with social media. And what that did to us is, is information overload. It has created addiction, created doom scrolling. And as I read these, just ask yourself, like, do you, do you think that this is true? We, we, as I was reading them, I'm like, yep, we have shortened attention spans. Um, just last week, there was an article about how Instagram's ads connect pedophiles to children. Um, the algorithms just try to connect people. And then we have uh, increasing polarization. We have, of course, a lot of bots and deep fakes. Um, cult factories, or you can look at them as very niche uh, parts of the internet. And then uh, fake news has been and continues to be a, a problematic uh, situation. The breakdown of democracy is um, definitely contentious. But uh, the liberal democracy countries in the West have experienced quite a few challenges um, with some of these algorithms because anyone can buy algorithms. And uh, the 2016 elections uh, in the U.S., they've been shown that algorithms that were bought or sorry, uh, ads that were bought during that time um, that were able to influence people's opinions and that. Um, there was malicious intent behind um, state actors who, who did that. So in this uh, presentation, which again, I really recommend, um, they talk about that was the first contact. 
And then they said the second contact is what we're experiencing right now when you see the flooding of generative AI everywhere. And um, I'm a huge fan of generative AI. I think I, I've used ChatGPT. Um, I subscribe to Midjourney. And in fact, there's two images in this presentation that are, I used Midjourney for. However, they warn that the second contact with AI in the form of generative AI is going to create even more problems. Um, they, they talk about reality collapse, fake everything that we're going to have trust collapse. So, um, I think that first line is the, the most important part. So, um, reality collapse because, and I don't know if this has already happened to you, but it's happened to me because I use Midjourney a lot. I kind of have a sense of what those images look like. And now when I'm on Instagram, there's some images where I I know for sure they're from Midjourney, but now I'm starting to see more, and it's it's as if like now I question what's real and what's not real, what's Midjourney, what's not Midjourney, and um, then we've got a lot of fake everything because we we can do so so quickly, and fake doesn't have to always be bad. And I'll give you an example back to our digital personas. Um, there's something called Luma AI, and what you can do is you can upload a picture or a few pictures of yourself and it will produce the most amazing professional headshots. And it's truly incredible. And I start to see people online use them. I have not used it because for me, um, I have reservations about that because I want, I want my picture to be me as me as possible. I want it. So I, the picture I have does not have any edits and there is no like fine tuning of my eyes or anything like that. And I feel like that's a, that's a mini, a mini authenticity protest that I want to have because I worry that that's just the beginning. And then after that, we're going to have even more of ourself be digitally altered in a way where there's this big digital barrier between you and me. <laughs> and I think it's ironic that I say this as you are looking at me as an avatar. Um, but I think it's something that's that's worth thinking about, particularly now that Apple has released um, their new their their new uh, AR glasses, and um, that headset has the ability also to do FaceTime. And if you haven't already seen uh, the videos, basically, if you have that on your head and you're doing FaceTime, you can see other people who are on a computer, and you can like put them in like suspended in the air around you. But the thing is, those people can't see you because you have the headset on your head. And so what FaceTime can do for you is FaceTime can create an avatar of you that looks super close to you. That will be what those other people see of you and the face and the mouth will all move in kind and the same thing with the expressions. And there's no need for AI voice because you would actually be speaking. And so in that sense, you would literally be able to um, wake up in the morning and not even do your hair or anything or shave or put makeup or anything. And you would look like this perfect version of yourself as you're talking to people. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, has great use cases, but I do think that there's a slippery slope if that's the option that we choose for everything in our life, because then this is another space where I think that it's going to challenge our identity if we don't start to think about it then we will go down a path so far where we start to say, well, wait a minute, I don't identify with any of these things that are me in the digital space. And then um, another thing I want to point out is the synthetic relationships that already exists. Again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that, that I think that that's something um, we need to be cognizant of. So the next thing in this rapid technology space is um, these headsets have the ability, well, the technology already exists to monitor the waves in your brain. One example is a mindfulness technology called Muse. And you put this band around your forehead and you meditate. And as you do, it, it picks up the waves and it then tells you how you meditated, how well you meditated. You can take, is everybody hearing me okay? Yeah, I can hear just fine. Okay. 
And um, so this technology can be embedded inside headsets like the Apple one, like the Oculus and all of that. And in this sense, we would be giving a lot more information than we realize and a lot more information that we're giving today. Um, so Nida Farhani, she wrote a, a recent book uh, called The Battle for Your Brain, Defending the Right to Think Freely in the Age of Neurotechnology. And she talks about um, brain and mental privacy and a neuro sovereignty. And um, if you think this is very future, uh, you just listen to any one, any podcast episode she's done. And you'll realize that a lot of this technology already exists today and it's being used um, in places like um, the trucking industry um, or factories. Um, the sites, the places she cites are in China where if you're wearing a hat and this hat is able to sense how tired you are. And if you're tired, then it tells kind of the supervisor and then you have to like stop working because you're tired. So in that sense, it can help prevent injuries at work. And then with uh, drivers, long distance truck drivers, this can help prevent accidents and save lives. And so there are, you know, very interesting use cases, but also there's a slippery slope ethically that, um, we should definitely have conversations about. And um, then to our conclusion, our identity and humanity. So all of these things are changing. And if up to this point, you haven't thought that they affect your identity and humanity, then I hope this section will. So as a thought exercise, who are you without your digitally augmented self? If there was no more Twitter and there was no more Facebook and there was no more TikTok, they all went down, who would you be? And I think the more important question is, is who would you want to be? Because there's some people who are someone online that they don't really want to be, but they feel like they have to be. So all of these technologies were meant, advertised, and promised to bring us closer together. But actually, the more we have of them, the more lonely people will become. And in the UK, in 2018, they launched a loneliness strategy to combat the rise in loneliness. So loneliness is actually a very serious thing. Uh, it can reduce your lifespan. It can cause um, all, all kinds of diseases, uh, mental health issues, and loss of productivity. And this is a very bold and good initiative, I think, to say this is a problem that the government needs to think about and care about. So there's a loneliness minister in the UK. And uh, on the uh, Steve Colbert report, when this happened, uh, he said, hey, UK, are you okay? Uh, making a joke of it. But sure enough, this year, just last month, the US Surgeon General released this report on our country's state of affairs around loneliness and isolation. And it's an epidemic here too. And so I, I think that this is a, a really good moment to say, what are the impacts of a loss of identity and community and loneliness? And there are a lot. And um, there's a part of feeling lonely because you can't connect with other one, other people, because you don't feel like the person you are is part of a community. There's many reasons for being lonely, but one of them is, is that. And so I think that as part of this loneliness epidemic situation, um, discovering our identity, being authentic to ourselves, and, and intentionally trying to be our, our authentic self is, is going to be pretty important. I used Midjourney to make this. Um, so the concern that I have, that I am seeing as I look at all these new technologies that are around, and so like the metaverse, this is another place for us to express ourselves, to interact with others, but also to be a different person than we are in real life. For me, I've chosen um, uh, an avatar 
car that looks quite close to me. I gave my picture and the Ready Player Me created um, an avatar. I like the way my hair is on this avatar. It's pretty close to what I wear every day. And I like identifying with something that really feels like me. And, but if I, I didn't, I think that um, the, the dissonance, the delta, the difference would be so great that I, I think that I would be mentally challenged every day to have to be so many people. And in that sense, um, I think I would experience identity vertigo or identity dissonance, and that would also create isolation. And so I'm not saying we shouldn't be beautiful unicorns in the metaverse. We should, we should be one. I'm, I'm saying that we are those dragons, 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 um, expressing ourselves at least verbally and on text in an authentic way so that, that we, we are not so different. And then uh, reality vertigo, when we have all of these deep fake videos and our Instagram starts to get more flooded with um, things that are not real, then I think that that would be a bit problematic and that we would need to intentionally try and, and hold on to what is real. Um, and that could look like going to um, a state park, going to nature, um, interacting with something that is very, very kind of physical and close to how we've evolved over millions of years. So um, the questions that I want to leave you with are, what is your identity? Not what society has told you your identity is or should be, or where your, what box your identity should fit in. What is your identity? And who and where is your community? And what is your reality? And who are you, but more importantly, who do you want to be? Separate from who, what anyone else wants you to be. This is another mid-journey picture. Uh, technology is great, but not if we lose our sense of self or our sense of reality. And um, I'm going to end with another Taylor Swift quote that I found very fascinating around this topic. She didn't, she didn't talk about this, but I think it's very relevant. So she has another song in her recent album. Um, she said, so speaking about her song, Mirror Ball. So Mirror Ball is like a disco ball in this picture. Uh, Taylor Swift explained that it was about people who have to be on all the time and shiny. And that, quote, you have to be a, different versions of yourself or different people, different versions at work, different versions around friends, different versions of yourself around different friends, different version of yourself around family. Everybody has to be duplicitous. She goes on to say that she believes it is part of the human experience, but it is also, quote, exhausting. And that, quote, everybody has the ability to be a shapeshifter. But what does that do to us? So thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation, and I look forward to your thoughts. And I hope you enjoyed it. Wow, great, great presentation, Dr. Lydia. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, yeah, another round of applause. This is pretty, pretty interesting. And uh, just letting everybody know, if you have any questions, the floor is open for a quick Q&A. If you have any questions for Dr. Lydia, um, and you can always write in the chat as well. And one thing that I, I saw you mentioning that I wanted to comment on, of course, that I've seen the uh, the, the whole thing that is going on this week in the past week about the virtual girlfriend thing. And I mean, the <laughs> social media took it by storm, you know, kind of polarizing this discussion. Like, is this okay? Is this not okay? Where is this taking us? And I just wanted to bring some light. Um, of course, that there's different opinions on how we interact digitally and how that is bad. And that's a conversation that has been going on, you know, since early days of Facebook and virtual messages and texting versus being in person or, you know, even the telephone, right? Like I have, my grandma used to have like a little chair next to the telephone and that's how she would communicate to people. And there were conversations like, oh, we're not meeting in person anymore. Um, and this mm -hmm. is going to keep happening. Uh, but always, you know, it, it, it also offers some different possibility. And this is, of course, my opinion here, but I just wanted to make a statement. We at Sunken Blimp, we created the stage where we are meeting virtually, right? 
Uh, but what, how is that different than going on YouTube and watching, let's say, your recorded presentation on YouTube? Although we are virtually here, we are able from all over the world to be able to access this presentation in a spatial way that has mm -hmm. similar physical qualities in terms that I can walk around and I can get close to you, if, even if we turn the spatial audio, right? I can have a private conversation with you when other people are walking around, they can join the conversation and get far away. Uh, we actually have here someone, Kev, who's sitting right there, which we met in one of these dive lives a few months ago, actually several months ago. And he started coming to this. We started talking after the presentations and we actually ended up meeting in person uh, two times now in New York City. Uh, we traveled, you know, nice. and we met. Uh, so, you know, it offers this different ways of communicating and different ways of interacting. And I just wanted to shed some light onto this other side. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. It's a, uh, but you see when you, when you talked about that, the highlight was how it culminated in not just one in-person meeting, but two. And it, it's not like you can have meaning in so many ways. You can have meaning in in-person relationships and on in digital ones. And in fact, um, millennials and Gen Z, but apparently particularly millennials, do really rely digitally um, to maintain their friendships. And I think that uh, it has a lot to do with age um, and uh, also generation experience. But age, because um, right now, Gen Z, a lot of them are have the opportunity to to hang out a lot in person because they're younger and many are in college or still kind of starting out, don't have kids, et cetera. And then um, the, the millennial generation, they're already like mid late thirties and the oldest are like early forties. So you're, you know, you're well into the kind of mortgage kids managerial space. And so some of the best ways to keep in touch are digitally. Um, but it's still, it's important to say our, what is our community? Because no matter what, before the internet came along, we were still weaving in and out of friendships because life, life stages change things. And so the same thing in, in, in digital spaces, is some digital spaces made sense a certain moment in time and then others won't. But I think that reiterates my point about really being in touch with our identity so that we can more purposefully engage with it. Okay, I see a question here from Pookie in Amsterdam. Um, do you think that people walking a mile in others' virtual shoes, lives, environments would help us develop empathy? Um, I think so, because um, there is discrimination and, and microaggressions and aggressions and sexism and racism um, everywhere. And so I do think that if someone let's say who was a man made their avatar a woman that they may start to experience some aspects of what women experience online and vice versa with other aspects if we you know, wear clothes that could be culturally representative of something um, we may experience how others interact with those kind of people but the best thing is to actually talk to to people and ask them. And uh, well, I have a couple.